going to bring in Amanda Winters from Once in a Wild Zoo. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. The morning went well, and I'm looking forward to this <laughs> exciting afternoon. Thank you for kicking it off with some wonderful <laughs> animals and all your knowledge about them. No problem. <laughs> so I'm going to mute myself so that your photo, your screen is bigger. Yep, no problem. Hi everybody, my name is Amanda. Our company is called Once in a Wild. We are an animal encounter company and we usually bring the zoo to you in person. But right now we're helping out with, of course, this wonderful um, organization, which Alina has invited me to come be a part of. And I'm very appreciative of being invited. Um, we are, um, like I said, an animal encounter company. So today we're going to bring it to you uh, in uh, live stream, obviously, and we also do our own live streams too. So we're a little bit experienced with this. So we're going to be meeting three animals today. And again, my name is Amanda. So let's go ahead and begin. We have our first animal coming up. Yeah, it looks like our, our last animal looks excited to see you guys, but it's not her turn yet. So the first animal that we have here is going to be a snake. This is Slytherin, the California king snake, and he is a beautiful California king snake. These guys are from California, of course, and they are a wonderful non-venomous species that actually benefits humans. And a lot of times snakes are misunderstood, and a lot of people think that they only eat rodents, but this actually is a species that will only, well, that will eat not just rodents, I should say, but they will eat all kinds of different animals. They call them the king snake for a reason, and that's because they eat other snakes sometimes. And of course, king snakes and other snakes are not salad eaters, so they're only going to be eating other animals. But that's why they call them the king snake. The king snake is known as that because they sometimes eat other snakes too. They might also eat lizards, rodents, birds, all kinds of things as well in their diet. Snakes are very beneficial to the natural environment because they do, um, of course, they are a carnivore, so they do help to keep the populations of rodents down in our natural environment. So they are very important to us. And snakes, like all reptiles, are cold-blooded or ectothermic, which means they don't have their own body temperature. So that means he's the exact same temperature as the room that I'm in, which is in the 70s right now. He doesn't have his own body heat like we do. So I'm sure my warm hands feel good to him. <laughs> I sure hope so. But these guys can also go without eating for a long time. Um, a king snake like this can go a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks without eating comfortably. Um, here in my care, he gets fed about once a week though, and he does tend to eat pretty much every single time. King snakes are known for their very, very voracious appetites. They are wonderful animals. These guys have an amazing sense of smell. So snakes don't have any ears. Um, they can't hear in the traditional way. They can feel vibrations though. So he might feel vibrations along the ground if someone were to walk up next to him. And, uh, but their sense of smell is amazing. These guys have a forked tongue, which will come in and out of their mouth all the time, as long as they're awake and trying to see what's going on around them. They will be flicking their tongue in and out of their mouth, just like that. He's got an amazing organ on the roof of his mouth called the Jacobson's organ, which can tell his brain all kinds of information, just like a computer. Um, regarding smells. And he's taking in particles of those smells all the time with his forked tongue. Since his tongue is also forked, it helps to smell directionally, just like we have two ears as humans. He doesn't have ears. He's got two points on the end of his tongue instead. That helps them to figure out what's going on around him. He can use that sense of smell to be able to find food, like another snake or, or a rodent or something like that. Or he can use his sense of smell to, to uh, sense out the world around him in general or uh, danger around him. Since he is a snake, he is a predator, right? He is a carnivore, he's a hunter, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have predators too. So that brings us to the reasoning behind the coloration of this animal. So the California king snake kind of looks like a sea snake, but a California king snake is non-venomous, non-poisonous, no harm to humans whatsoever, which is why I'm able to hold him, of course, safely. He's also a sweetheart. He's not going to bite me. Um, but these guys also use their coloration and pattern to scare away their enemies. They might have enemies that want to harm them or eat them too. Just like he's a carnivore, he also has predators too that might eat him that are carnivores too. And um, having this stark kind a black and white pattern like this is going to warn those animals that he might be dangerous. Although in this case, it is a bluff. It is pretend. He is just using mimicry or pretending to be dangerous, like a sea snake or like another animal, for example, um, even a porcupine. A porcupine in Africa and even porcupines in the United States have a little bit of black and white on them. But porcupines in Africa have black and white on their quills. And that will tell their enemies that they might be dangerous. And in the porcupine's case, it is true. So that is the California king snake. Again, his name is Slytherin. 
we are Harry Potter fans around here. So we have a few animals that are named after Harry Potter things. Uh, and he's, his name is Slytherin, just like the house Slytherin Harry Potter, right? He's a beautiful snake. I'm gonna check timer really fast. Make sure that's all good. These guys are often misunderstood for being slimy as well and also being dangerous. This type of snake is not dangerous to humans. There's only a few snakes in the world that are dangerous to humans. Now, for that reason, I recommend that we don't pick them up or try to harm them because you're just putting yourself in danger by next to snakes, right, in close proximity. And of course, an animal that is in danger by you is going to try to defend itself. So we're going to make sure that we stay safe by leaving snakes alone and letting them do their job, which is to eat rodents and keep those populations of rodents down in the environment and keeping us nice and healthy. We want to stay healthy, right? And keeping rodent populations down is going to help us stay that way. So thank you, Slytherin. Thank you for being a wonderful snake and a wonderful animal ambassador. He's going to rest down below. We're going to meet our second animal. I'm sure you're going to love. And it's actually another black and white animal. And I didn't even do that on purpose. We're going to meet a second animal here in just a moment. Thank you for having patience with me. It takes a second to put the animal down and pick up the next animal. So this animal is very, very different. We're actually going to meet a mammal next. We met a reptile first, of course, right, with a snake. This here is a hedgehog. Can you see her? <laughs> so her name is Shirley and she's an African hedgehog. So we met a local species here in the US, right? With the California king snake. Now we're meeting an exotic species, which is the African hedgehog. So there are three main species of hedgehog in the world. One is the African, it's the smallest species in the world. Another is going to be the Asian hedgehog. See you later. <laughs> and another one is going to be the European hedgehog. European hedgehogs are the largest of the three main species of hedgehog. <laughs> so as you can see, she's kind of looking around and being a little nervous. That is the, um, the nature of a hedgehog. Hedgehogs are very tiny animals. Even the European hedgehog is a pretty small animal. So the European hedgehog is about yay big and the African hedgehog is this big. And being an animal from Africa, you might imagine she is just kind of in her nature to look around, be a little wary, be a little nervous, if you will. But she is, whoa, she's out of here today. She's leaving us. She's going to fall into my lap. <laughs> she's on the move today. These guys can actually run 2 to 12 miles every single night. Um, they are a nocturnal animal, which means they are not awake in the daytime usually. So I have woken her up to do this program, but don't worry, she's kind of used to it. She's gonna settle down just a little bit in her ball. Um, these guys have amazing spines all over their body, which they use to defend themselves. I say all over their body, but it's not on her belly. Her belly is soft and has kind of normal hair. Her spines are all over the dorsal or backside of her body and head and forehead and things. And she's gonna use her amazing skin, which can stretch all the way around her body to keep herself safe. That skin is really similar to a hooded sweatshirt. When you put a hoodie on and draw the drawstring on your hoodie, that's actually going to um, bring that hoodie around your face, right? That's kind of a similar maneuver that these guys do with their skin. They have a built-in hoodie <laughs> all over their body. Their little legs are protected underneath that skin. And um, she can use her spines, which are just modified hairs, by the way. She cannot shoot her spines. They're called spines, not quills on a hedgehog. Look at that cute little leg. She's showing you her little leg. Um, these guys have amazing spines. They cannot shoot their spines. It's just their hair. So just like we cannot shoot our hair when we're upset, they cannot do that either. Would you like to settle down right here? She's on the move today. I've never seen her so hyper. So these guys, um, like I said, they have these spines for protection from their predators. Their main predator is actually the owl. So there are several owl species in Africa that might eat these guys. And because the hedgehog is out at night and the owl is also out at night, that means that they're out at the same time. So that makes sense. And the owl actually has really long talons, which can come and pick up the hedgehog. And those talons are their toenails, right? They can come and pick up the hedgehog without getting injured from the hedgehog's spine spines <laughs> and then the um the owl can use their tools of talons and also their tools of a beak to eat the hedgehog but don't worry we're not going to let her hang out with any owls here at once in a wild she is just fine even though she's acting so silly right now hedgehogs again are nocturnal which means they're out in the night and awake uh sleep in the daytime and out at night so she might just be a little bit crabby from being woken up from her nap now these guys are not rodents. They are often mistaken for being a porcupine. Um, porcupines are rodents and rodents are of course in the rat and mouse family. And <laughs> these guys are actually in the shrew family. Shrew like mammals is what they're closely related to. Goodness gracious, can you calm down? Calm down, Shirley. It's all right. There's no owls. I'm sorry I talked about the owl. I must have upset her by talking about her enemies. Um, so these guys are insectivores. That means they eat bugs. So they don't have rodent-like teeth. 
that never stop growing like a rodent incisors. Rodents have to wear their teeth down and eat all kinds of things like vegetables and things to keep their teeth worn down. Hey, all kinds of things. If you guys have pet guinea pigs or hamsters, you know, they have to bite things to wear their teeth down. These guys don't have those kind of teeth. They have spiky teeth, kind of like an opossum. Blech. And they're going to be using their, um, their teeth to munch on bugs. That's what they eat for a living out there in the African savanna and forests of Africa. Well, I think she's ready to go run around, I guess. So let's go ahead and meet our last animal. I know we're, um, we're only doing like a 30 minute right now. I don't want to go too long, but look how cute she is. She is so cute. Her little noises are what a hedgehog would sound like. They make little hissing noises. And right now I'm so sorry she's so upset. She's not usually like this. Settle down, baby girl. You're helping to benefit cancer awareness. Did you know that? She's so cute. She has a really cute little tongue that's pink. And I think she's adorable even when she's upset. So good job, Shirley. You're a wonderful animal. These guys, again, are prey, but also predators. So they kind of, kind of fall in between. So we have the carnivore with the snake. We have an animal that is both prey and predator, right? So she eats bugs. So she's predator to the bugs, but she's also prey for owls. And I'm so sorry to talk about it. <laughs> Look at her cute little nose and tongue. There's the tongue. There she goes. Everybody loves hedgehogs. Remember hedgehogs are kind of grumpy during the day. So they're not really the best pet in the world. Um, they're not very cuddly, as you can see, but they are very fun to watch um, run around at night and they run on their wheel up to 12 miles a night. So they need to have a wheel to run on. Well, thank you, Shirley. I'm gonna check our time really fast. Oh, we're doing okay on time. Good girl, Shirley. She is so cute. So again, these guys are from Africa. So this animal would be found in the same exact habitat or home as like an elephant, a rhino, a giraffe, a lion, a hyena, all those animals live in the same habitat as a hedgehog. So if somebody asks you next time, oh my goodness, if somebody asks you next time what a African predator is, you can actually say hedgehog and you would be right. Hedgehogs are predators for termites. They're gonna live around termite mounds and under the ground near termite mounds. And those termites will come out and they will eat the termites at night. So little do the termites know that they are actually helping to house their predator, predator force. And these guys can climb a little bit. They can climb a, a slope, a slow sloping slope. <laughs> and um, to get down, they're actually gonna roll back up into a ball like she's doing right now, very grumpily. And they can actually roll downhill in that ball and her spines will actually keep her nice and safe while she's rolling down away from maybe an owl, right? If she's up at the top of the termite mound, climbing around, and all of a sudden she maybe hears an owl or something like that. These guys don't have great vision. They have a great sense of smell. They might smell the owl. Owls do not have a sense of smell. Whoa, I have never seen her run around like this. She's absolutely crazy right now. Settle down. That's what animal training is though, right? We're not going to make her do anything, but I'm also not going to let her jump out of my hand either. It's all right. Everybody tell her it's okay. Goodness gracious. You don't have to be so nervous. Sorry about that, guys. She's jumping around just like she would do. This is what they would do if they were um, feeling threatened. So of course I'm not threatening her. I'm not hurting her or anything like that. But if a owl were to come over and try to pick her up, that's what they would do. They might try to run away too, I guess. I've never seen her run so fast. Okay. Well, I think that's my signal. She's ready to go back underneath her blanket and take the rest of her nap and go back to bed. I think I would feel a similar way if somebody woke me up in the middle of the night too. I woke her up in the middle of the day to do the program. So for her, it's her nighttime, but she's so cute. You're fine, I promise. Oh, goodness. Okay, so we're gonna let her rest. <laughs> She's a crazy girl today. So we're gonna meet our final animal and don't you worry, <laughs> she is very, very ready. She's been ready this whole time. <laughs> so we met a, a reptile. I'm just laughing at Shirley so much. She's never been that way before. Um, we met a reptile. We met a mammal, right? And of course mammals have hair. They're warm blooded uh, as opposed to the, the reptile being scaly and cold blooded. And now we have an animal that actually does have scales but it's not a reptile. And it's not a mammal either. Let's see if she'll make her own entrance. Come on. We're gonna open her little door here. <laughs> Come on. Good job. So this here is Pikachu and she is a beautiful bird. Did you know that birds have scales? So birds do have scales, but their scales are actually on their feet. 
Isn't that cool? They have scaly feet. That is a feature of all birds. Another feature of all birds is going to be their feathers. So not all birds fly, but all birds do have feathers, at least for thermoregulation or keeping their body warm and cool, whatever they need, right? Um, so that's gonna be in replacement of fur. So she doesn't have fur or hair because she is a bird, but even birds like penguins and ostrich and things like that, those guys have feathers too. That is a feature of all birds, even flightless birds, pretty cool. This is not a flightless bird as you saw her fly, she is a flying bird and cockatiels use their feathers to fly. They flap their wings, they spread their tail and they can fly and they're really, really good at it. That's important for this kind of bird because she is a animal who is a prey animal. So she is definitely a prey animal. She is not a predator. These guys do not eat other animals. In nature, they are found in Australia. And in Australia, they're going to be gray colored with a little bit of white, a little bit of yellow, and those orange cheeks will be present on the wild animals too. So those orange cheeks are kind of just to look really, really beautiful. Males and females both have orange cheeks, but males have much brighter orange cheeks than females. And that is called dimorphism. Dimorphism is when we can tell the difference between males and females very, very easily. And cockatiels are dimorphic. So hedgehogs are actually monomorphic and um, the California king snake snake monomorphic too, um, meaning that at first glance, an outward appearance, other than the obvious with most mammals, right, with a hedgehog, um, you can't tell the difference between males and females. They look almost identical. But this type of bird in the wild, they will be gray with that beautiful um, kind of white markings and beautiful face that is yellow and orange, and the males would be brighter colored. So that often happens in birds to be able to attract mates. So the prettier and more bright color that he is, the more likely he will get a girlfriend. And these guys are actually a monogamous type of bird. So they will find their mates and then stay together for the rest of their life, as long as neither of them pass away, of course. And these guys are also animals that will help each other to raise babies. So when they decide to go ahead and breed, they're usually about two or three years old when they start having a family. And these can have anywhere from two to about um, I think four to five eggs that would be kind of high in this species um, but it's usually around three or four eggs at, in a clutch and mom and dad will both sit on the nest and keep the eggs warm until they hatch they hatch in about three or four weeks more or less I can't remember exactly how many days it is for this species every species is different but um, most parrots it takes about that long uh, maybe up to a month and um, then the eggs will hatch and then they will have little tiny um, featherless babies that cannot see and they're totally reliant on mom and dad to feed them and both mom and dad will actually feed them sit on them until they're feathered and then they can leave and uh, that is both parents that do that so they are very very good family birds not only are they loyal to each other their mates, they're also loyal to their families and to their kids. Isn't that cool? Now, cockatiels are in the parrot family. They are a parrot, even though they are a tiny parrot. See how tiny she is? She is still in the parrot family. How can we tell? How can we tell? Well, she has a curved beak. Do you want more food? That's fine. Come here. She has a curved beak that is designed for like a tool, like a, it's almost like a wrench for breaking open nuts. So it's like a nutcracker. Um, these guys will break open seeds and nuts. Parrot, the smaller the parrot, the smaller the diet they have. So the smaller the seeds and nuts that they eat, but they still are eating seeds and nuts in the wild. They also might eat other vegetables and things too in the wild. And another feature of all parrots is going to be their feet. So I showed you her feet earlier. She's actually got scaly feet just like all birds but she's also got um two toes facing forward and two toes facing backwards we have a fancy word for that it's called zygodactyl zygodactyl feet are what parrots have as opposed to anisodactyl which are what most other birds have so that is pretty cool for them to have those special toes now the reason they have those special feet that are two toes in the front and two toes in the back. That is to be able to climb easier than most birds can. These guys also use their beak for climbing. They might grab onto tree branches and things. You've probably seen like a macaw or a big parrot climbing up um, a rope or a tree branch, etc. And um, these guys can do the same thing. It's just on a smaller scale, of course. They also use their feet for um, kind of like a tool for eating. So just like we have hands, this way we have hands and also um, we use tools like forks and knives for eating they're going to use their foot for like a like a hand grabbing their food and they use their beak for a tool for eating isn't that cool but that's one reason they have zygodactyl feet it gives them a better little grip on their food items and things that they eat ha ha ha
but she is a parent species. Cockatiels are closely related to cockatoos. Um, they used to be categorized with parakeets because of the size. But we now know genetically through testing and things like that, um, through science, we know that these guys are actually in the same exact family as a cockatoo. So the great big cockatoo that's usually white with a yellow crest, um, there are some that are gray and um, pink. There's all different kinds of cockatoos. It turns out that the cockatiel, what do you know, looks just like them. They're actually in the same family. So that's pretty awesome. These birds are very smart. A lot of people ask me if she can talk. Um, she does have a partner and his name is Evie. So we have Pikachu and Evie. And Evie is quite the talker, let me tell you. E Evie will actually mimic my voice. And even though it's not exactly like my voice, to me, it sounds really cool. Um, I can hear him saying the word come here. I can hear him saying the word perch because I tell them to get on their perch whenever I put them back in their home. Um, or when I take them out, I tell them to get on their perch as part of their training. And um, what else? He says, I believe he's trying to say lately. He's trying to say her name, which is really cute. Um, he does a lot of whistles and he definitely mimics my cell phone a lot too. I have a lot of different um, text tones that I use for different people. For example, the Twitter um, text tone is for my fiance, Ricky. And so every time um, <laughs> the bird mimics that cell phone noise, I always think it's my phone, which I think is so funny. But these guys are capable of mimicking, so they will copy other birds. Now, I don't know really what the purpose of that is. Um, I know that for some birds, they will mimic to impress their girlfriends and mates. Um, the more vocalizations and the more things they can say and do, the more impressed that the uh, female bird would actually be. So he would put on a show of looking really handsome, really, really bright colored, like I said before. Um, he might have a beautiful crest on top of his head, although the females both and the, and the males both have a crest. Um, but he, if he looks really, really pretty, he's probably got a more chance of, you know, getting that wife, <laughs> wife for life, that mate, mate for life, um, and uh, having a really pretty voice, mimicking all the things. I think it's part of their ability to attract mates. So that is my theory. I don't really know the mimicry part. It's something to look up for sure. Now, um, these guys are birds, like I said, and they are flying birds. Not every bird flies. So features of all birds, remember, are feathers, but not necessarily for flying, like penguins and ostrich, um, scaly feet, laying eggs, being a warm-blooded animal, that is actually part of being a bird, and being a vertebrate. So they do have a skeleton and backbone, all that, of course, right? So a bird that flies must be very lightweight. So I know she's a very tiny bird, so of course she's lightweight. You're like, yes, of course she is. But even a large um, flighted bird, like a quarry bustard, a quarry bustard is an African species that lives in Africa. And those guys, um, the males are up to 40 pounds, but that's as much as a flying bird ever weighs. They do not weigh very much. So even the largest eagle in the world, like the golden eagle or the harpy eagle, et cetera, those guys are less um, than 40 pounds. So they look huge, but a lot of the, um, the reason she's not even a pound, of course, she's a tiny bird. She only weighs, I would say probably a hundred grams at this point. She's super, super lightweight. But the reason is, is because they have to fly. It's physics. So the, the how of them being light is going to be a lot of things. Number one, it's those feathers. Feathers are much lighter than hair. If you take a pile of feathers and a pile of hair and weigh them, you will see that the pile of hair actually weighs a lot more and it's the same size. Pretty cool. Um, so feathers are very light. And they also give them surface area to be able to flap their wings and actually get lift. That is some more physics for you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. That's a lot of science. And um, these guys also don't have as many internal organs as mammals of the same size. So for example, birds do not have any internal organs that they do not need. They don't have an appendix. They don't even have a bladder. Um, these guys, when they have to go, they just go. And if you guys have ever parked underneath a, parked your car underneath a tree, you know what happens when birds are up in that tree, they go all the time. So you might end up with a dirty car because of that. But these guys um, do not have a tree traditional bladder. They do not have a traditional digestive system. Everything is very minimized. Um, they don't breathe with lungs. These guys have lungs, but their lungs are very tiny and stationary. And their way of breathing is going to be an air sac system. So that is a system that is throughout their entire main body cavity. It's really, really big, but it's hollow. So that's going to help them breathe with like a big bubble inside their body. Isn't that cool? And another thing that makes birds lightweight is going to be their bones probably heard that, that birds have hollow bones, right? It's not all the way true. They actually have semi-hollow bones, which um, are hollow kind of, but they also have like structures inside of them to make them lightweight. Come here. Come on. Good girl. Uh, she just wanted more snacks. Can't blame her there. All our animals are jumping off my hands. <laughs> so these guys are really amazing. 
um, like I said, they have semi hollow bones so that way their bones are very, very strong. So think of like a straw with a sponge inside of it. That's what a bird's bones are like. Isn't that cool? It's like I have five more minutes. I'm doing good. I tend to um, talk forever. So I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> I hope you guys have enjoyed our animal presentation. Again, this is Pikachu. We had Slytherin the king snake. We had <laughs> crazy Shirley the hedgehog going all kinds of crazy today. And uh, we have actually 65 animal ambassadors that we um, often will present with in animal programs. We also do live streams all the time on our Facebook, as well as YouTube and Instagram too. We actually do them on Fridays and Mondays right now at 3.30 PM Central Time, if you guys are interested in meeting our animals. And we are offering Zoom Room Animal Encounters right now, if you guys wanna meet any of the other animals. And uh, I, I assume that Alina has put our information on how to find us. So I'm not even gonna talk about that. But this has been a lot of fun. I really, really appreciate being here to help raise awareness about cancer and um, uh, blood cancer specifically, of course. And if there's anything else we can do to help you guys, please let me know. Again, this is Pikachu, the beautiful cockatiel. I didn't mention, by the way, her coloration is a special coloration that is bred for cockatiels in the care of humans. It's called a Lutino, not a Latino, but a Lutino. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky always gets a kick out of that name. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And I welcome. really love that cute hedgehog. I'm sorry we got Shirley out of bed. I didn't realize. <laughs> That's every time. So you'd think she'd be used to it. And I've never seen her so eager to leave. So I was like, okay, I guess you're done. We all, we all have our grumpy days, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people were looking forward to seeing the hedgehog. So that was a, a great choice of animal. Wonderful. She's very popular. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, so, yes, I shared uh your info during the week and we'll put a link again today as well okay. and um thank you for sharing the times of days and um which yeah. days people can find you because i know from watching ourselves angelo especially is addicted he never misses a show oh my goodness that's fantastic. i love <laughs> yes. that yeah you got gone on monday so mondays and fridays right now until further notice and then we'll, okay might adjust a little bit but at three thirty, you guys can be booked right for private parties and yes. and so on Yes, we, um, of course, do in-person parties when we're able to again, and we do parties, we do classroom presentations. She's going to release her bladder right now. There you go. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, the birds do. They get lightweight all the time. They have to lighten up so they can fly. Um, so yes, we do in-person programs, whether they be classrooms, nursing homes, animal therapy. Um, we do, of course, parties, um, events, anything you can think of. We can supplement them with animals, and we're happy to do that. Um, you guys can find us at onceinawild.com. That's how you can find our information. And of course, the live streams are, like I said, Mondays and Fridays at 3.30 p.m. Central Time here in San Antonio is where we're at. <laughs> and that's on both Instagram and Facebook. We do Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Instagram, we might be phasing out just because Instagram is getting a little bit trickier on how to live stream. So yes. we're going to see if we can figure that out, but we're certainly on YouTube and Facebook. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Gotcha. And the yes. video is also uploaded as well. So you can okay. watch it again. Great. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Amanda. And, and thank you to all your lovely animals. It's great oh, to see sure. them. No problem. <laughs> Our pleasure. Our pleasure. We'll see you next time. Okay. Bye. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And, um, the time and and education there was edu uh, donated in hopes that you would be moved to make a donation and help contribute to our shared passion to help fight blood cancer and end blood cancer now our next guest we have the beautiful ballerina professional ballet dancer alana i can't wait to um, show her off and she is forever a delight and fun good afternoon Hi, can you look hear at, me? I have a little mic. Yes, I can hear you very well. Look at you sitting so pretty there in your tutu. <laughs> you look beautiful. Tell us about thank yourself. You. Welcome. I'm, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be a part. Uh, I'm Alana Calhoun and I live here in San Antonio, Texas. I know Alina because she's my fabulous physical therapist. Of course, as dancers, we have a lot of <laughs> injuries <laughs> and uh, Alina has treated several of them and uh, it's great to have her around in this part of my circle. Um, I have been dancing for many, many years, I guess 33, 34 years. I'm only 25, but I have a lot of experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I grew up in New York and I grew up dancing in New York and I've danced all over the country in New York and here in San Antonio. 
um, in Miami, Florida, uh, Los Angeles, California, a little bit in um, DC as well. Uh, I currently dance with Alamo Arts Ballet Theater, that's local to San Antonio. Um, and that's at Ballet Art Studio with Judith Ghani, who is the owner, and our ballet mistress is Julie Morton Simpson. All right, wonderful. And what a um, great repertoire of experience of being in different cities and gaining different experiences. And uh, we're so thankful to have you here in San Antonio to be sharing your gift, your art, and your craft. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I was just lucky that um, you know, everything's closed right now, but I was able to use our ballet studio in order to perform for you guys today. So yeah, um, that's yeah, awesome. thankful for that. <laughs> yes, and thank you for that preparation. So I'd like to show the Cupid video first, if you don't mind. Sure, so the variation that we're about to watch is Cupid, and Cupid is from the ballet Don Quixote, which is basically a Spanish love story. And um, Cupid, of course, plays the part of Cupid, uh, and it's a cute little short variation. Great. Okay, so I'm going to go over there and share. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. I love your musicality and all the details from your, your extension to the fingers, your arm carriage, just exquisite. Thank you. Thank you. It's been hard, you know, because we haven't been able to rehearse or um, take class on a regular basis. So trying right. to get in shape, you know, in order to perform, I mean, it was a great challenge. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And that's a challenge for so many artists right now is listening to the dance edit podcast this week. They mentioned how the New York City Ballet, you know, they um, it was uh, a big shock to the world that we're not going to have the spring season in the theater. So they're going to do it. They have been doing it online and virtually on YouTube and so on. So they're losing a revenue because they're still paying their dancers. They're still paying their costumers even the ushers, everybody involved in production for the spring season, they're losing 1.8 million dollars. And so that's just crazy, but it's amazing that they are still supporting their artists during this time and that we're finding new ways to still offer the arts to the community. How's that been like for you and, and your studio here in San Antonio? Right, I mean, I haven't been involved, um, you know, in any of that administration. So I'm sure that it's hurting um, financially. And, you know, we are slated to perform in September, but I'm not sure um, what's going to happen with that. Um, I personally am just being very cautious and not really going anywhere. And so I think, um, you know, just more training at home and then maybe finding time, you know, when the, when the studio is empty to go in and use it and train um, is just going to be the option for now. Right, right. And so a lot of you dancers have been creative and still putting yourself out there. I loved your video last night with all the costume transitions in rhythm to the music. That was epic. <laughs> Thank you. It was challenging. I <laughs> bet. a long time, but definitely fun. <laughs> yes, yes. We shared that. I shared that last night. So if you guys want to see what I'm talking about, you can either go to Alana's um, Facebook page or you can go to mine or to her Instagram account. And it's, it's there. So you can enjoy that. So let's go to your next video, which is, um, not Cupid, Bluebird. Yes, is a bluebird. Yes, this is yes. the bluebird variation from Sleeping Beauty. Okay, so I'm going to transition us to over there. Bear with me. Thank you. 
Beautiful. <laughs> that one's even better. And I love the tutu. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh, your flexibility. You said you're 25. You're very flexible. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I know that you had a beautiful baby girl um, over yeah. a year ago. She's how, how old exactly now? How many months? 15 and a half months. Yes, yes. And she her motor skills are coming along fabulously, thanks to you, <laughs> in part. And so um, how has that been bouncing back from having a baby getting back into the studio and, and working again? Definitely challenging. Um, yeah. I, I ended up having a C section. And so I think um, it was even more of a challenge uh, coming back after major abdominal surgery. I danced well into my pregnancy. Um, I performed uh, at 20 weeks pregnant and I continued dancing on point until 32 weeks, I wanna say. Um, and then I continued dancing almost to the end until I just could not do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I went back to ballet, I think 11 weeks after the surgery, which might have been a little too soon. Um, but I did perform um, postpartum I guess that was March, April, May, June, July, August, September. So seven months, six, seven months postpartum, I performed on stage. Wow. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was challenging, but I think it's a, a great motivator, you know, to get back into shape and um, just have a purpose. Right. Other, I mean, of course, being a mother is my priority and purpose, um, but also, you know, being able to perform again is just fantastic. Definitely. And you've mentioned to me the challenges of getting back to being on point specifically. Yes. So yeah. talk a little bit about that, about getting back to on point. How does one do that? What are the, what are the issues? <laughs> I mean, you know, your feet um, develop such calluses and, and such um, strength that, you know, dancing on point doesn't hurt or really bother you after a while. But um, once you're not dancing on point, if you don't continuously at least put your foot in point shoes, then your toes become tender. And it's not something that we're very used to, um, you know? And so I, I was kind of like, what, what is wrong with my feet? <laughs> like, why are they hurting? So it took, you know, several days back in point shoes to feel like a little bit more normal. But then like the strength that it takes to dance on point is just so much. Um, and yeah, any time that you're off point for at like two weeks, you, you're you already starting from not square one, but you definitely have to build that strength back up. Wow, just two weeks. Yeah, you okay. can, I mean, you can be completely out of shape in two weeks if you're not training. Right, right. Yeah. How young do people start point these days? What is considered the right age to begin that process? You know, they used to say when the bones stop growing, um, but I see a range from like 10 to 13 okay. when people start going. I mean, but you know, the, the body has to be strong enough. The legs have to be strong enough. The feet have to be strong enough. The feet have to be flexible enough. Um, it, you know, because if the mechanics aren't there, it's just not going to work. Um, I have point shoes on now. Yes. Um, and you can kind of see like, if the foot doesn't have, let me tilt the camera down a little bit, but if the foot doesn't have um, an amount of flexibility that allows you to stand on point, then you are going to struggle um, because you're gonna be more here than on top of the point shoe. And that can be really challenging for dancers. Not yeah. impossible, people do it. Um, yeah. but it certainly makes the task harder as if dancing on point wasn't hard enough. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there's a yeah. lot involved, like with depending your foot shape, your genetics, and then the type of shoe. So the Russian point shoe is good for a certain type of foot. And then there's other shoes for other feet. So it's really important. I imagine to find people who are knowledgeable to guide you. Right. Yeah. And there are some dancers who can only wear one pair, like one type of shoe with one maker. Um, my friend Mallory, I don't know if she's watching right now, but she um, she helped a lot in coaching me with the variations that you just saw. And um, she has a very specific type of foot, beautiful, beautiful feet, but she can only wear one size and one type of shoe um, just because her foot is so flexible and beautiful. And it's really hard when they're out of stock in that shoe because then she's right. completely stuck. So yes. mm -hmm. um, it can be really challenging. And you know, in the bigger companies, they have their shoes made for the dancers. So they have their own, um, their own people who make those dancer shoes. Right, right. 
And so for budding ballerinas who are trying to get themselves seen out there, um, trying to land those auditions or places in schools, what advice would you have for them, especially right now with the change of the environment? Um, it's hard to say, you know, with the pandemic, but in general, um, you have to have a very thick skin and you have to be stubborn and you have to stick with it because they, you're going to hear no 800 times more than you're going to hear yes. And you just have to keep focused, keep training, uh, expand your training, train in different types of dance um, and, you know, even uh, different types of sports that are safe, you know, for your legs, of course, as ballet dancers, we try to protect our bodies as much as we can. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, any sort of cross training that helps, you know, in terms of your fitness and flexibility and muscularity and things like that is very important. But yeah, you just have to stick with it because it is a tough, tough, tough world out there and people will say no and you just have to keep going. Okay. Yeah, that's good advice. So you said that there's a show slated for September. We'll see. But what, tell us about the show that you're preparing for. It would be our second performance of The Dancing Princesses. Um, yeah, so it's an adaption um, from The Dancing Princesses, which is an old, old story um, about uh, these princesses who sneak out of the castle at night and dance um, without their father knowing. Uh, it's very cute ballet and we premiered it last September. And so we're supposed to do it again this September, but we'll see what happens. Maybe okay. we'll zoom it to all of you. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Let me know so we can share and definitely I want to see it. And so sure. if it does get to be live and in a theater, where, where will it be performed? We usually perform at the Carver, the Joe the Long Carver. Theater mm -hmm, on Hackberry. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> So thank you so much, Alana, for sharing your art and your craft and your skills and your experience and knowledge for budding dancers and letting us know where we can find you for thank future. Thank you. I'm happy to be a resource. And thank you so much for including me today. Yes, my pleasure. <laughs> okay, we'll be in touch, Alana. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was our wonderful Alana Calhoun, professional ballerina. And you can find her um, performing this September, either at the Carver Theater Live or if things change, perhaps virtually we'll find out as things unfold. But you can find her on Facebook and on Instagram and enjoy her uh, videos and sharing her work there as well. And I, she occasionally does YouTube as well. So look for her. So we'll be back with Maitri and she's going to perform an East Indian dance of the Kathak dance genre it's called a Tarana. So let me bring Maitri into the room. Hi, Maitri. Some of you look beautiful. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Of course. And can you tell us a little bit about the piece you're going to perform? Hi, everyone. Namaste. My name is Maitri Acharya, and I am in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, the RTP area. And today I'm going to be performing a Kathak piece. So Kathak is one of the many Indian classical dance styles from, this particular one is from North India. And the piece that I'll be performing is called a Tarana. And it's basically a rhythmical piece, um, different varying speeds and footwork and spins. And um, it doesn't really have a meaning, but it's just uh, very uh, beautiful music and very rhythmic. So that's what I have for you today. Great. I'm going to mute myself so you become the full screen. Okay. Yes. And let me just make sure you can see me and then we'll get started. Is this okay? Yes. Perfect. All right. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. That was so beautiful. Wow. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank everyone who's joined to watch. A lot of my friends and family are out there as well. Thank you for all, all your support. And anyone who's watching, if you feel inspired, please contribute to this beautiful cause. And Elena, I thank you <laughs> for organizing this and inviting me. And I also want to give one more shout out, if I may. Sure, of course. My guru. Yeah. Thank you so much for teaching this beautiful tarana. It's just, uh, it makes my soul very happy. I hope I did it justice. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Beautiful words. Don't go away yet. So yes, um, I'm glad that you gave a shout out to your guru. And clearly, you've been a good student because for us, the, the non- um, you know, we don't know the, the technique and the intricacies. It looked perfect. And I know how those nuances of the different um, head movements with hand movements and the timing that rhythm perfectly and transitioning between them. I mean, you hit, it looked like you hit every single one perfectly. It's not easy. I noticed if I didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And, you know, as a flamenco dancer and you study flamenco too, it's always interesting to see East Indian dance and see how flamenco was influenced by that root. Absolutely. There are so many similarities in the footwork, in the, the hand movement. Yes. And even the aspect of ole. So in Kathak, we try to hit this, it's called a sum. And every time you hit that, the audience usually claps for you. So it has a very similar uh, sentiment as an ole in flamenco. So. Yes. I saw you reaching out to the audience. There are certain gestures where it look like you're trying to engage the audience. Right. And we met right through Flamenco, Elena, at the Flamenco Festival in Albuquerque, and we've been friends since. So yes. We're keeping in touch through our arts and on Facebook. Exactly, exactly. And um, I'm happy that I met you back then. You were a warm, um, a good heart. <laughs> and for somebody who had never been there before, didn't know anybody, it was, you know, great to connect with someone like you. That was just so easy to befriend. So yeah. namaste. <laughs> And soul and beautiful soul for organizing this and this fundraiser, Elena. And you've been working really hard to bring this together, all these wonderful performers and speakers. And you've been running around all day performing <laughs> yourself and um, putting on presentations, the tacos. <laughs> Vegan, vegetarian tacos. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. And thank you for putting so much effort as well into the costumery. Like, you know, one of the joys of um, observing Indian culture and, and dance and music is the, the richness, the color, and, and the, I just love the jewelry. <laughs> this is one of the traditional styles. It's called an anarkali, and it has leggings and a full top. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of um, gifts. So when you take turns, it really accents the turns. Right. And so in this um, Tarana, so Kathak has evolved over the years and initially started as an ancient um, temple dance where the dancers were using Kathak to tell a story because Katha, the word itself means uh, storytelling. And so it evolved from the temples to more of a performance art over the years. And so that's when we added the bells to the ankles, um, faster spins, and um, you know, almost like acrobatic, acrobatic at, at some points. So, right. Involved. And the Tarana is more on that aspect, the performance aspect. Right. And so I know you're in North Carolina as well as your guru. So if there are people in the North Carolina area that would love to, you know, learn this art, 
how would they contact or find out more? So the academy that I learned through, so Dr. Kriti Rakesh teaches at Akriti Kathak Academy, um, A-A-K-R-I-T-E, Akriti Kathak Academy. And that's located in Morrisville, North Carolina. It's the RTP area, Research Triangle Park. And she has a beautiful school, um, big studio with a, a really wonderful group. We're one big happy family. And we train towards getting our certification. So it's a very rigorous curriculum, uh, very serious, but also we have so much fun. We perform throughout the year at festivals and local events. Um, Including some big ones that I saw in your, your resume. We on big productions, but we have such a good time doing it. So while we're learning, you know, the um, technique and she's drilling us every day with footwork and everything. So we have, you know, that the fun side as well, but it, it is a, it's a really, um, rigorous curriculum, but very, uh, you know, it, it pays off once you learn all the, all the technique and everything. So then it becomes really fun to perform. Yes. <laughs> it looks like it would be. Anyone out there wants to learn Gothic in this area, please do come join us, come check it out and look us up on the website. Great. I'll put a link in a moment in the comment section. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for donating your art and your craft and time to this cause. And I hope people will in kind, you know, give a donation to LLS to help us in our shared passion to end blood cancer, to fight blood cancer. Yes. So thank you. I hope so. And thank you for watching and thank you for having me. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. See you guys. I'll Bye. So I hope you enjoyed that beautiful dance. Wow, what a, a lot of work goes into a dance like that. It's not a short one either. And all those details take a lot of practice and, and, and technique and skill. So thank you, Maitri, again, for sharing your art with us and your time. We'll be back with a piece by George Gershwin, someone to watch over me. We've got two world-renowned musicians, a pianist and a trumpeter. They are husband and wife. They teach and perform all over the world with other world-class artists as well. And so I hope you come back to enjoy that. It will be amazing, like everything so far. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Okay, we are back, and it's almost the top of the hour. And so we will soon bring into the room uh, Paulina and Steve Lessering. Yay! <laughs> How are you? Good. Good afternoon. You look beautiful. I love your dress. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank yes. You. <laughs> so tell us about yourselves, guys, before we hear you perform. Well, uh, I'm Steve Lystring, and this is... Paulina Lystring. <laughs> we live in Lawrence, Kansas, where we both teach music, and uh, we perform together uh, from time to time, and a lot of times separately as well and and uh so we're happy to be here and, and to contribute yes. yes and thank you steve for sharing that uh youtube video of your online class with all those gifted students what an amazing job you're doing and your students are excellent <laughs> well, that, was, that was a lot of fun those were students over the last 20 years that Wow. With, and we've all we all got together and people made made individual recordings for that from literally all over the world. From, uh, yes. Europe, Asia, U.S. and Puerto both Rico. coasts, Puerto Rico, everywhere. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Because I know you are a constant world traveler teaching, doing conferences, etc. Yeah, I do a lot this year. Not first time. But yes. <laughs> you know, as things progress. Nice we'll, year. <laughs> might get back to normal at some point so. and, and bring you back to san antonio because i you usually get to come here once a year yeah i was planning yeah. i was planning to uh this summer but yeah we'll have to do it, i think so yeah oh i was so <laughs> looking forward to seeing you guys again <laughs> i know yeah hopefully soon. next year maybe yes hopefully soon so tell us about the piece you're going to perform together well, we're doing a piece that we we like it because not only the music but the the meaning, and right. we thought it's appropriate for this this event. Mm -hmm. um, it's called "Someone to Watch Over Me" by George Gershwin. Yes. It was actually written in 1926, so it's almost 100 years old. But mm -hmm. uh, the thing that makes it special is uh, it's literally been performed by hundreds, if not 
thousands of artists over the last 94 years. Um, it's everybody from, from uh, Frank Sinatra to Ella Fitzgerald to contemporary singers still do it. It's just such a wonderful piece of music. And this is a very nice arrangement by a, a New York, New Jersey uh, arranger named Joseph Turin. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Well, if you're ready to go, um, sure. let's right. start. I'm going to, just so you're not um, shocked, I'm going to minimize me um, or take my camera and sound off so that you become the big screen. Okay. Yes. Bravo. <laughs> beautiful. You. No wonder you two married. You make beautiful music together. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 11 years ago. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. 
And we actually were really impressed because we have four little dogs in the same room and they all were really quiet for that. So yeah. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> Good children. Good for our babies. <laughs> Yeah. We knew they would make a lot of noise from the yeah. other room, so we decided yeah. to take a chance. And they're right here with us, and yeah. they just were listening too. So. Oh, nice! That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me about how you guys are doing right now. So, I know that university year is probably going to look very different in September. Are we moving in online classes only? We don't or? know yet. Yeah. There's uh, today's actually the official graduation day for the University of Kansas, or what was to be. Okay. So I think they're going to get through this and they've already put summer classes online and in, by, you know, in the next few weeks, they're going to assess what's going to happen next fall. Okay. It may be a combination, maybe they may have people coming back. It just, a lot depends on what happens in the next month or so, I think. So sure. we're making the best of it. Uh, I, we're both teaching online uh, yeah. and it's actually, it, it's actually uh, not bad. We, our approaches are a little different, but my, my students, I can speak for anyway, are learning a whole bunch of different things that we might not have had time to, to, to deal with uh, in person. So I don't know about. Well, it's pretty much the same. So, yeah. Actually, for her students, uh, young, she has a lot of younger students, and it's actually right. been a good thing because it gives them something to look forward to, and they, they really miss her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, they practice a lot more, so I'm happy. Ah, <laughs> silver linings, I love it. <laughs> exactly. But the I, reason, uh -huh. sorry. sorry, go the ahead. Reason I did that video with all those students was, yeah. you know, it, it's music still has a role um, in any crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. Music is what brings people together. It's what mm -hmm. connects the world, and yeah. so um, hopefully that message. You know, my my feeling is we won't digress from what we knew before, we'll appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. So we'll appreciate concerts more, we'll appreciate, you know, getting together more when this is all over. So um, I'm not too worried about music going away. If anything, it's going to be become something to unite us once again, so. Yeah, good words, but I, I agree with that. Feeds the soul, how could we, uh, you know, continue to not need that, especially now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you're seeing a lot of creative things come out online, which is never would have happened if, if it weren't for this uh, this situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not saying there's a silver lining, but there, mm -hmm. you know, there we find a way. You know, uh, yeah. humanity finds a way to make the best of, of whatever situation that we can. You know, so absolutely, and that that point or statement is true about this event that I've hosted and had you guys in on. If it hadn't been for our pandemic, I wouldn't have thought of it. You know, before I was gonna do an event at a local uh, venue and it would have drawn a small crowd, but this way I'm getting an international crowd, uh, people across US and, and Canada, and then getting, you know, performers, friends from all over the world connecting again. Um, I keep joking, like I have to hold an event to see everybody I wanna see again. <laughs> including you guys yeah so you know in that way yeah something good can come out of something bad we are able to connect yeah so so good luck i hope it's gone smoothly for you today yeah and, and, thank uh, you <laughs> so far so good tiny glitches nothing major <laughs> great, great. yes well thank you again guys and um i could post links if you like where people could find you for online classes if you want to message them to me on Messenger, and then I'll put them in the sure. comment section. Sure, that would be great. Yeah, we're happy yeah. to do that. So. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Send you a message. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Go okay. Jayhawks. Go next year. <laughs> <laughs> best wishes. You All too. Yeah. Thank Take you. Care. You too. Bye. 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 Wonderful, that was beautiful. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, we've got lots of ways for you to donate and give thanks to our performers, our artists, our speakers who have given their time generously, hoping that you will also feel moved to help contribute to our shared passion to fight and end blood cancer. Hello again, we're back and we're almost at the top of the hour. So next we're gonna have Lisa Pache teach us how to use our makeup and look our best especially when we're doing these online virtual events. 
Hey, girl. How are you? Hey, how are you? Good. So good to see you. I know. It's been too long. <laughs> I know it has been long. But I keep following you. I love all your posts and your amazing makeup jobs. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't wait for you to show us what to do. We need you now more than ever. I know. It's so crazy because at Starbucks recently, I haven't been wearing any makeup because we have to wear the masks. Oh. And so since I'm on bar, like you have like all morning, I'm like sweating. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> I like go to work with just mascara. I don't put anything on my face. <laughs> Welcome to my world. That's my world every day. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, oh, and then like, since we don't have anywhere to go either, I haven't really sure. been wearing makeup on the weekends. Right, right. But so many people are needing to wear makeup to accentuate themselves for the virtual world, whether it be work or social. And I'm yes. sure men too could probably benefit from accent accentuating themselves just like anchormen do on TV and so on. Yes, I've noticed that doing virtual like meetings online, like for school, like I was like, oh no, I need to put something on because I look crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn off my video so that you become the main screen. I'll still have my um, mic on so you can still, if you need anything, tell me, I can still respond. Okay. And I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, hey everyone. So I have already washed my face and I've moisturized my face and I use my 3D time-wise set here. And that's what I use morning and night to make sure that my face is nice and moisturized for the day. And I'm gonna first go on with my oil mattifier. So this, for me, I since I am oily, mostly in my T-zone, I like for my makeup to stay on. So if you're a person that still has that eight hour job, you're doing meetings online well you want to just make sure that your makeup is staying on all day so this is what I like to put on just in the t-zone area very you don't you need like a pea size amount I rub it into my hands make sure I get the product nice and warm and I like to tap it onto the face where I have that oil and I want it to absorb so this is gonna keep my face from being oily, even here at the house when I'm doing online meetings. Next, I'm gonna go in with my primer. This is um, a silicone-based primer, but I love it because it actually makes your face feel really velvety smooth. It doesn't move around anywhere. It keeps your makeup from la like uh, coming off of your face. It keeps the makeup on. So like you wanna make sure that you use this when you wanna put on your makeup because if you are just putting the foundation on your face first, your makeup's not gonna last as long. It's just like the same as when you're painting a wall. You wanna make sure that you prime that wall and then you put on the paint. So it's the same as when we're doing it for our face. The same, I use a pea size amount. I rub this all onto my face. I put this everywhere because I put my makeup all over my face. And this is so soft. It makes your skin soft. It covers the textured areas in your skin. I have a lot of textured areas here because I have larger pores. And it really fills in those pores for me when I wear my foundation. And it leaves your skin really smooth. Also, the fun thing about this primer is that it's an SPF 15. So you don't have to worry about putting any more SPF on your feet. I'm actually gonna go in with a CC cream. I normally like to use my TimeWise Foundation 3D, but since this is more of a harder coverage of a, of a foundation, I'm not really going anywhere. No one's gonna be seeing me but the screen. So I like to use the CC cream. This is a color corrector, so it's actually going to correct to your skin tone. And I like it because I have a lot of redness in my skin from my actual acne scars. And they are going away, but I still like to cover it as much as I can. And with the CC cream, I am able to do that. And it actually looks really pretty on the skin. It's lightweight. It doesn't feel like you have anything on. So if you're like in a hurry on the go, wanna get your makeup on really quickly for your meeting, this is the best way to do it. It's with the CC cream. So I like to put just two pumps on the face. I'll put it directly onto my face. And I'll spread it out with my fingers. So I'm the type of person that likes to use fingers and brushes. 
because it's just easier for me. And I have my mirror over here on this side, so I'm gonna look in the mirror. So I like to get this spreaded all over the face, especially on the cheeks where I have the most coverage or where I want to cover the most. My forehead, not too much. But I make sure I go right underneath those eyes, bring it down. And I know, it. don't worry, you're gonna blend it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Don't get scared yet, y'all. <laughs> okay. So I like to spread it out. Next, I like to go in with my foundation brush. So this is really dense. And it's really gonna help you smooth out your foundation. It's lovely. It like really puts it into the skin. I love this brush so much. And I'm actually using the light from my window. So it's a little <laughs> bright. It's bright in here. I was gonna try to use the zoom on my phone because my camera phone is a lot better than my computer uh, camera. But it wouldn't let me download it. Oh. I don't know why. So I was like, OK, I'll just use the computer. So I will blend this all the way down, make sure I get on my chin, make sure it goes down into the neck. I don't go all the way down, but I want to make sure that it blends very well. And even wearing the mask recently, since I've had to wear it at work, Starbucks, I work for Starbucks. So I've been like sweating while wearing the mask the first couple of times and I broke out even more around my face, especially around my mouth. But slowly but surely it has been going away, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> so see, it just gives you an even tone. It's kind of hard for you to see. Let me see if I can back up. No, that looks good. I can see a difference already. I like that brush. It really does. Yeah, the, this brush is amazing. I love this brush. It's it's a game changer for sure. I've always used like a beauty blender and this is also for Mary Kay, mm -hmm. but the brush, like this brush changes everything. So that brush is for Mary Kay also? Yes, this brush is also for Mary Kay. So everything that I'm using today is for Mary Kay. And what's the name of that brush again? This is a foundation brush. Okay. So it would normally go with the 3D foundation that we use, but I like to use it with both the CC cream and the foundation because I see that it, it really just spreads out the product even more. Yeah. Instead of using your hands all the time. I like to use this. If I'm in a real hurry, I will just use my hands. But <laughs> normally I'll do both. I use the brush and my fingers. So I am actually going to conceal my under eyes. I naturally have darker under eyes underneath, but they're not puffy or anything. I just have kind of like a darker set skin there. So I'm gonna go in with a lighter shade from my face. I'm gonna go in with a deep ivory. This is a concealer that we have. And I don't put that much. You really don't need that much. I've seen people go in with like the whole triangle thing. <laughs> yeah. You don't need that. <laughs> it's too much. Maybe so I want the Joker effect. <laughs> yes, I've seen it and I'm like, wow. And to me, it's like, you're just wasting your concealer, really. Right. You don't need that much. So this, I will go in with a sponge and I will blend this out underneath my under eyes. And this is really just to get that brightened under eye so that you don't look too dead. You want to look a little bit brighter there. We'll take it down the nose just a little, but I won't put this all over my face. You don't want to brighten your whole face. Unless you're doing like a photo shoot or something like that, then sure, go in with all of that. Brightening concealer, contour, everything. But it fits for a virtual online. You want to be real quick and just be ready for your day. A little bit of concealer underneath that eye is going to look really nice. So to set all of this, I like to use my translucent powder. This is a very fine powder. It's no color, so it's for any skin tone. And it doesn't have talc, which is nice. I don't like using anything that has talc. And I will use an all over brush. So it's just a big fluffy brush. This is also from Mary Kay. It's a powder brush. And you don't need too much. So just a little bit, I'll tap it off. 
and I will put this underneath the eye. Does that, so this, does that sorry, help prevent the um, um, going into your uh, wrinkles? If you have wrinkles, preventing that foundation from kind of like melting into your crevices, does that help that? Yes, so this is also what you could use for your setting powder. So this is an all, all over the face setting powder with no color on it. So I also have another powder here that I like to use, but this is the mineral foundation powder and it is a color and I'm in beige one. So this is something that I like to put on with my CC cream if I'm going out somewhere and I want that more coverage like to my face, then I will use that. But mostly that I'll just put on the translucent powder and that really covers everything. And it keeps your makeup lasting. Right. So I just like to roll this all over the face. Mostly I'll put it underneath my eyes because I don't want that concealer to crease and I want it to stay all day. But this, this is just all over the face powder. And you don't need too much, just a little bit. From here, I like to personally go in with the rest of my face and I do my eyes last. Interesting. So, yeah. Is there a reason? I know. Some people like to do it their eyes first, but I like to do my eyes last. So I have my palette here and this is everything that I like to use. And this is also from Mary Kay. I love this palette. And I personally have made this palette myself. So you can go in and get the colors you want online and you fix up your own palette. And it's just, um, it's, it's magnet. So you can take oh, it out and replace cool. it. Yeah. So I'm gonna go in here. This is the cheek brush. So it's a little bit slanted. Mm -hmm. So I like this. I like to use it for my contouring and I like to use it for just regular blush. But for right now, I'm gonna go in with just a bronzer and it's gonna be this bronzer over here. The one right here in the middle is my contouring but I'm not gonna use that right now. So I'm just gonna go in with something light just to make sure that I have a little bit more color around the cheeks. So I'm, I like to start up here at the top and I'm just going to tap this into the skin. And this brush is so soft too. So this is what's gonna give you a that illusion of you having those cheekbones. And that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. And especially for me, I have a round face. So I have to make those cheekbones on my face. <laughs> and I love this bronzer because it's it has a shimmer to it but it's not too much to where you can see it it really blends in well but it just looks like your face has a nice glow so I mean you can see that already how it's already yeah, like right really contoured and chiseled my face and I'll go ahead and put this slightly at the top of my forehead just to make my forehead a little bit smaller, but not too much. And we'll go down here on the chin. The nose, the nose I do last because I don't put too much product there, but I still want to look like my nose is a little bit thinner, especially online. I'll again go in with my all over powder brush and I'll just go out and blend this. I'm not adding any extra product onto here. I'm just gonna blend out what I've already put on the face. So just very carefully blend out that area. Just so that we don't have any harsh lines. If you have put on maybe too much, you can always go in and blend. Now I'm gonna go in with a lighter blush. So this is my Rose Nude. I love this blush. It's very light. It looks very pretty on the skin. It looks different on everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is more of a pink color for me, but I've seen on like maybe darker skin tones, it looks more of like a peach. And then on the lighter skin tones, it looks of like more like a nude color. Everybody's under skin tone always brings out different colors of blushes and foundations and I really like that. Everybody always looks very different. Yeah. I like to put my blush right on the cheekbones because it, that's where I want my front of the face to see and I just leave the brown on the outside from my contour. Plus I like the apples of my cheeks to look more rosy. 
And I'll do a little bit on the nose, not too much. Just make it look like I've been outside in the sun. And I got a little bit of a tan. All right. Looking good. So that's it for the face. It's pretty quick. It's not anything crazy. If you want to go in with a type of highlighter, you don't have to, but I like to use highlighters all the time. And I actually like to use my finger to put on my highlighter. So this is actually glazed. And it is from Mary Kay. It's this one up here in the corner. And it's really light. It's a light shimmer and it blends in with the skin. So I like to put this above where the sun would actually pretend like it's hitting you on the face there. So I'll put it right here, right underneath my eye and same on the other side. And I find that when I put this on with my finger, you could use a brush, but I feel like when I put it on with my finger, I get more pigment from that highlight and I really like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are going to do one color of eyeshadow today. I always find that like women feel scared with putting on eyeshadow or like they're afraid of color. So I'm gonna do a one shadow, which I really love to do. This is what I really like doing at work as well. So I'm gonna go in with Golden Mauve. It's a beautiful like rosy brown kind of tone. It has a shimmer to it. So I'm gonna put this on the lid. I use my fingers, I'm gonna make it easy. I like to use a brush, but I like to put it on with my fingers first. So I'm gonna go in and put this right on the entire part of my lid. Just go in and throw it on there, don't be scared. <laughs> because we are going to get that brush and we will blend it. And this is also really quick too. Once you when you use just the one color, it's fast, but it looks pretty. So what I like to use, this is a Mary Kay brush. This is the all over brush. It's just very, a very little big like brush here. At first I'm gonna go in, I'm not gonna put any more product on this brush. I am just going to blend that top crease part because I don't want that harsh line to be there. So we're just gonna blend it very softly up into the eyes. And we're gonna do the same on the other side. And you're gonna see that you're not gonna really need any more product on there. Once you've put it on with your finger and blended that shadow up, it looks really good. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that's just one shadow. Right. Nothing right. else. If you right. wanna go in and put it underneath the eye too, you can also do that. I like to use a brush for that, a smaller brush. So you can go in and put that under the eye and I'll go ahead and show you that as well. This I is a smudger brush. So it's a little bit smaller. You can kind of see how small it is there. Very little, you do not need a lot on the brush. And you can go in and put it underneath that eye just to give a smoky effect. And you're using the same color, yes, that you put on the upper lid? Same, yes, same color. And that's the golden mauve. And it does have a shine to it, but it's really pretty. And that's it. So it looks like you have like a smoky eye mm -hmm. and you've only used one color and that's all. And I love that you just put it on the lid and blend it upwards. That's a great technique. Yes. And I find it easy when you use your fingers for some mm -hmm. people it's like oh my god all these brushes i don't know what to do well make it easy for yourself put it on with your finger first and then go ahead and put that brush on blend it so i'm going to go in with my mascara i'm going to use a new mascara today this is actually going to be my first time using it and it's from mary Kay. it is our summer limited edition this is called the lash fanorama and i've been hearing some good things about this mascara so we're going to see all together today what it's all about I actually like using the Lash Love from, oh, look at me, I already got it underneath my eye. The Lash Love from Mary Kay. And I like it because the brush is a lot thinner. This brush is a little bit thicker than the one I'm used to using. And me, I always get mascara somewhere on the face. It, does, it never fails. 
<laughs> Especially if you yawn or sneeze after you just put it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the time. So I, when I use, when I put on my mascara, I like to start right at that lash line and I bring it all the way up. And I don't use any more, like some people are like, woo, 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 I gotta keep like putting more mascara on the wand. No, all you need is that one pull out from the wand and that mascara is on there. You use that for both of your eyes. Trust me, you don't need any more mascara than that. So I was really excited when I got this yesterday from mm -hmm. my director because I'm waiting for mine to come in. <laughs> I, I ordered mine on the 10th, but it hasn't gotten here yet. Now, what's your recommendations okay. with color of mascara? Should everybody go for like a darkest black to make your eyes pop or should lighter, fairer skins go for a brown? Does it matter? I love using black only because I feel like it does make the eyes pop, especially if you are somebody who puts on that eyeshadow. And if you use like a brown color, that it's not going to really show too much if you already have like browns or neutrals on the eyes. I've used a brown uh, uh, mascara before, but I feel like it doesn't give that like oomph to the eye. I always like using black mascara. And I feel like black mascara on like blue eyes or green eyes look so pretty because like their eyes just like pop like you can just really see the blue and the green yeah yeah i'm glad <laughs> to say that because me too i prefer the the blackest black for that exact reason make them pop yes all right so they're long <laughs> and all i did was curl my lashes so i mean this wand is actually pretty good i like it and I do put mascara on the bottom. Okay. Always for sure. All the way around? All the way around. So I'll do mascara on the top. I'll start on the top first. And then I put that mascara down at the bottom. Now I am going to do my eyebrows really quick. I normally like to do my eyebrows with a shadow. I'll do a brown shadow and put that on. But I, for real quick, just going online and I want my eyebrows just to have a little bit of that color. I like to use the brow volumizing tint from Mary Kay. And it's just like a little, like kind of like a mascara brush, but smaller, like way smaller. And I'm using the color brunette. And so I'll just brush this on. And this is going to volumize that brow without having to go in carefully with a brow pencil or like me when I use my shadow. Not, see, look at how that. Oh, look great. at it. Yeah. Right? It's fast, it's easy, and it doesn't go anywhere. It dries and it doesn't melt off of your eyebrow. And it, it doesn't have color. It's just a volumizer. It's a volumizer and it does have color. Oh, okay. So there's different shades. I want to say there's four to five shades, and I'm in the shade brunette. There is a shade darker than this. Mm -hmm. So I like to match it to my hair, to my hair though. So yes. whatever, if you have like a lighter blonde type of hair, like yours, yours is like a, what is, do you have dirty blonde or is it like a blonde blonde? It depends what time of year, how much sun I get. <laughs> <laughs> like yours, I would think that you would use like the blonde. There is a blonde color on there. And I think that would look really good on your eyebrows. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So there's different shades, four to five shades, I believe, but I use the shade brunette. So that just really, I mean, it just brings out the brows. It just, to me, when you have your brows filled in or even like colored, however you like, I just feel like it's like a finished look and it just looks pretty. It just looks so natural, you know, instead of that drawn on line. Yes, I don't like the drawn on line. That's, <laughs> I, I don't like using pencils. I used a pencil back when I was in middle school, high school, and I don't do that anymore. <laughs> 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 we've taken it a step up yes so to finish off i'm going to use my mary Kay lipstick and this is a new color it's called blush velvet and these are here to stay so this is just a regular nude lip since i have a nude eye i want to match my lip to my eyes i love to do that and i love lipstick i, I need lipstick every day And this color is just so nice. Pretty, yeah. 
It's really subtle. It's nice. It's nude. It's soft. Keeps the skin. It keeps the skin. Keeps your lips very moisturized. Now you're blessed with nice full lips. What do you recommend for thinner lipped people to give it a more plump look? I have a friend who has thinner lips and she likes to use the lip liner. So she'll get a nude lip liner close to the color of her lips and she'll overdraw them. And not too much to where it looks, you know, a little too yeah. overly drawn, yeah. but she'll overdraw like either the top or the bottom lip, mostly the top because her top lip is a little bit thinner and then she'll go on and put on whatever lipstick she wants. But since she has that line already there, it's easier for her to follow. Gotcha. Yeah, but I, I, I like to use lip liner, but I don't use it as much as I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need it. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. I'll use a lip liner if I use like a darker lipstick, like a red, then, right. I'll, then I'll use a lip liner because I want it to actually like stay on. Yeah. And is it true that really helps the bleeding? So it doesn't go into your upper lip, like the color doesn't it bleed? It does. Yes. If you're a woman who has a little bit more wisdom than everybody else and you do have those bleeding lips, then yeah, I would say to use a lip liner and then your lipstick. Okay. And there is also a lip primer that we have and I haven't personally used it but I've heard other women that have and they really like it and it helps the bleeding of those lips great well you look beautiful everything. yeah thank you I know it feels great to have makeup on now I've been waiting all day for this <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you've been like naked all day <laughs> I know well, thank you so much, Lisa. I, I put in the comment section some of the products you mentioned, including a link to you as a, the Mary Kay Independent Beauty Consultant so that people can find yes. you and, and for tips for service, for products, et cetera. And I'm probably gonna be reaching out to you for that bra, brow volumizer. <laughs> yes, it's my favorite. It's like the best thing and it's quick and easy. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So again, thank you, Lisa, and I hope to keep seeing you out there, and I'll keep uh, liking your posts. I love all your makeup posts. You, you do an you. amazing job. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Of course. I'll never forget that you did me at my wedding. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> Flamenca's from way back. <laughs> yes. Yes. I miss all of you guys. We miss you, too. <laughs> okay, Lisa, thank you. Have a great thank weekend. You. You too. Bye. Bye. Well, that was really cool. That was some great tips on some basic beauty tips to enhance yourself um, for your virtual meetings, whether social or work and not uh, overdoing it, but just keeping it nice and natural and accentuating yourself from Lisa Peche. And again, she's a Mary Kay independent beauty consultant and her contact uh, link, you can just click in the comments to reach out to her. And she donated her time for our cause, hoping that again, you may be moved to make a donation today. The link is above on this Facebook live feed. And so no donation, great or small is um, unappreciated. So next we're gonna have Jessica and Jessica D'Souza from LLS is gonna speak to us again. She did it this morning and did a great job about telling us all the work that LLS does and why we're doing this and why it's necessary. So let's bring her into the room. Hi, Jessica. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you this afternoon? Good, good. Thank you. I've been watching everybody on today. It's been pretty incredible. You've had a lot of really great people. Right? I am so yeah. lucky. I am blessed with like not only knowledgeable and talented, but beautiful, good looking people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Absolutely. I keep hopping on and seeing different people and, and what they're talking about is great. I mean, it's been a really great range of topics and yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming back again this afternoon oh, and making the time to share with us everything LLS is doing. So take it yes. away. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to share a few um, little facts about what LLS does and then share the story of our girl of the year, Lily, um, and her personal battle with cancer and then kind of a little bit about what we're doing on the pediatric side. So um, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is a global leader in the fight against cancer. Our mission is to cure leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, and myeloma and to improve the quality of life for patients and their families. Um, we are the largest nonprofit funder of blood cancer research. 
investing nearly $1.3 billion in the most pioneering science worldwide since 1949. Um, we're also the leading source of free education and support for blood ca cancer patients and their families. We provide personalized one-on-one -on -one support, including assistance with identifying and enrolling in a clinical trial, um, which is a new um, great service that we offer to get patients connected with a clinical trial. And we have people who are experienced in that that will search for those for blood cancer patients. Um, and with our nationwide grassroots network of more than 50,000 active online volunteers, we also drive policy changes that accelerate the development of new cancer treatments um, and break down barriers to care. So um, our, we have a girl of the year, Lily, um, for the man and woman of the year campaign. Um, she lives here in San Antonio. Lily was born a healthy baby girl on a sunny Saturday afternoon in January. Lily's always been a silly and outgoing girl who loves to play with her cousins and love on any, any animal she can get to. But when she was three years old, she started experiencing urinary tract infections. Um, after she was treated for three UTIs in the span of a year, her parents and her pediatrician agreed that if she got another one, her kidneys would be tested. On a Tuesday afternoon, shortly after her fourth birthday, Lily spiked a fever and her mother took her to the closest urgent care clinic. It was confirmed she did have another UTI, but when her mother told the doctor that she felt like Lily's belly looked a little more bloated than a four-year-old should, the doctor ordered an x-ray and the images were astonishing. One of Lily's kidneys was a normal size and the other was the size of a grown man's kidney. Um, Lily was immediately sent to the emergency room. And then two days later after tests and biopsies, Lily's parents were told that their sweet baby girl was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The very next morning, she was in surgery to have a porta cath placed and she began, she began chemo that night. Um, thankfully, she was very seldom slowed down by the chemo. Um, and apart from her hair falling out, you wouldn't have even known she was sick. Lily is now gratefully in the final phase of her treatment and actually had her last in-hospital chemo treatment on May 1st, which was the day we started our Man and Woman of the Year campaign. Um, so talking about pediatric cancers and thinking about all of our children, um, children who live right here in San Antonio um, and across the world that are being diagnosed with blood cancers, LLS has really taken a hard look at that. Um, and we are disrupting the status quo with our bold vision for young patients to not only survive their cancer, but to thrive in their lives after treatment. Um, and while many children survive a diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the most, which is the most common form of pediatric blood cancer, the treatments are very harsh and outdated. The long-term effects of current therapies can create severe life-threatening complications and survival rates with children, for children with other high-risk types of leukemia are very poor. And that's why LLS is more than doubling our investment in pediatric research. LLS is also pioneering an unprecedented collaborative clinical trial to fundamentally change the way pediatric blood cancers are treated. And um, also while expanding the services and support we provide to patients and their families. The Children's Initiative is a $100 million multi-year endeavor. And we believe that cures are achievable and with the Children's Initiative, we're determined to realize them. So um, just wanted to share that Lily's story. She's such yes. a girl. Um, so I wanted to share that. And I know that pediatrics is a, is, can be a hot topic and um, it's hard to see our kids go through something like that. And now that I have kids, it's even harder sometimes to read the stories and hear the stories about sure. the parents who are diagnosed and, and you just never know, um, you know, what my husband was asking, what the symptoms are for, for blood cancers. And it, you know, people find it in a whole variety of ways. So of course, when you have kids, everything scares you. Um, but what LLS is doing in pediatrics is really incredible. And so um, it's really neat to see that we have doubled our efforts and we're, we're making such a huge push to take care of the youngest ones. Yes, that's great. And thank you for sharing her story. I'm so happy for Lily. Last training, congratulations, Lily. Yes, yes, it's so it's great news. And she's doing really great. Um, has a sweet little sister, and they just run around and play and are happy all the time. So nice, nice. Yeah. And Jessica, do you know why the pediatric realm in blood cancer has fallen to the wayside and only getting attention now? 
Yeah, so with pediatric cancers in general, um, it's a smaller population um, of people who actually get cancer. So um, even though you would think our children are the most precious, um, it is a smaller population uh, um, kids that get cancer versus adults that get cancer. So in the um, world of research, it's not as profitable. Um, and so that is definitely one reason, but LLS is not about that obviously. And so we are really working on areas, um, we call them our areas of unmet medical need. Um, that's why we started with AML because it was one um, cancer that had had no new treatments in 40 years. So we knew that we needed to do something. Again, AML was a small population of people um, that actually get diagnosed with that. And so there wasn't a lot of funding being put towards that. Um, and it's the same with pediatric cancers. And so um, we really, you know, took another look at that and, and made a big push. And, and, you know, pediatric cancers have, um, survival rates have increased pretty drastically. So in the 1960s, even, a child diagnosed with leukemia had a 5% survival rate. And today it's a 90% survival rate. Wow. So yeah, so survival rates have really increased drastically. And that's another thing is that um, with a, such a high survival rate, um, you know, there's other things to look for um, or other things to look at, but with pediatrics, especially um, those patients have a lot of side effects. So, um, you know, they're treated at such a young age almost all of them treated with um, treatments or drugs that were designed for adults that were right. given to children. Um, and so it's caused some really crazy side effects. We had an honored hero who survived blood cancer, um, but because of her treatments has 75% kidney function and she's 11. So for the rest of her life, she now has to deal with this, you know, issue with her kidneys um, that came on because she needed to save her life from the cancer. Um, and so, so it's definitely looking at the survival rate, because obviously 90% isn't 100%. We want right. to get there. Um, but then also the, the harsh treatments that we have to give our kids. Right. The thing to look at. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And perhaps with children, it's harder to study because they're still growing and adapting and changing immune systems exactly. you know, are developing. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's why, you know, they have such trouble with side effects too, is because their bodies are still growing and you know, we're killing a lot of the good stuff in their bodies when we're taking care of the cancer. And um, so that really affects them as they are growing and changing. And so, yeah, that's definitely one of those pieces too. Right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I was gonna ask you, um, you know, with our Man Woman of the Year uh, campaign this year mm -hmm. being affected by COVID-19, so everything's yes. been virtual and online, changing the way our gala is this year. So instead yes. of having our face-to-face um, -face at the lovely Tobin Center, which was going to be so I exciting. Know. <laughs> yes. I know. So I know we're moving to next year instead, but people can still buy tables. Yes. Even though yes. we're doing a virtual. Absolutely. So our event has moved virtual. Obviously, this is nothing that any of us planned for this COVID coming upon us at this point. Um, and so we've had to kind of pivot and change a lot of things that we're doing too. Um, so that event has moved virtual, but yes, you can buy tables. So um, typically we would sell a table to our event, um, which this year we were excited was going to be at the Tobin Center for the first time. Um, those tables are 5,000 and you can still buy a table. Um, what will happen is we will invite you to the virtual event this year, um, give you some special recognition there, but then also invite you to the 2021 event. Um, which hopefully we'll be back at the Tobin Center if all things work out. Um, and so, um, yes, yeah, so there's still some, definitely some benefit. Obviously it's not gonna be the same, but um, there's still some great benefit to being recognized this year and going forward into next year. Yes, yes, great for sharing that. And then with the silent auction that normally happens at the gala, mm -hmm. uh, I know we won't be doing silent since it's virtual. Um, is it going to be for people who only have purchased tables or can anybody get in on this auction? Yeah, so so it's going to be online. So our, our silent auction will be online. Um, so as long as you register to the event, you will be able to bid on that. So um, the what's great about a virtual event too is that we can invite more people um, because you may, you know, you don't necessarily have to live in San Antonio now to attend our grand finale event. So that's a great opportunity to invite more supporters um, to celebrate at that grand finale event. Um, but then once they register for that event, they will be able to bid on auction items online. Great, good to know, yes. So I want yeah. to, I want that message out there in case anyone listening in. Yes, absolutely, 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Jessica. Well, thank you again for joining yeah. us uh, of round course. two. <laughs> of course. Thank you. And good luck with the rest of it. I know you've got some more great presenters. Like I said, it's been a really great day. Yes. So for everybody out there, please um, donate to Alina's campaign. What she's doing is remarkable. Um, and we all know that with COVID, we weren't expecting this. So um, this has definitely changed um, what the campaign looks like, but you are still doing this, which is huge, incredible, motivating, encouraging. So um, please, please, please donate to Alina's campaign and um, every dollar counts. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, that was really good to hear about what's happening with pediatrics and, and blood cancer. So uh, thank you, Jessica, for sharing that information and also giving us some insight on how people can participate in our gala this year, no matter where you live worldwide. So um, go ahead and, and if that's something that speaks to you, please join us. There's gonna be great auction items for the gala. They are um, some really nice like expensive items. And I know my team has put together a few, um, including a wreath for Fiesta, 20, 28 inches in diameter, a gorgeous Fiesta wreath to put on your door. You'd have to have a pretty big door over a fireplace. Um, we have another wreath that um, could be used for the 4th of July or Memorial. So it is um, with the colors of the American flag and it's just gorgeous. You have to see this thing, the different ribbons that are put into it, the work done by hand by Holly Denton, one of my team members and very dear friend. She just did an amazing, beautiful job. And so those items are gonna be available. And then the other item I was recently donated thanks to a friend in Canada. So Joanne McDonald, who is creative director of Piper and Sky. She has stores in Canada and US and New York. There are luxury handbags that are um, responsibly sourced using leathers responsibly so that um, if you're going to use leathers this is the best way to do it and her her bags are just gorgeous so she's donated a bag that can be bid on for that silent auction or the virtual auction coming up July 10th for our gala so I'm going to put on a slideshow again um, a repeat of this morning's slideshow of just some stats and facts about LLS and and blood cancer until uh, we come back with our next presenter, which will be at six o'clock. And super excited to bring on at six, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Genevieve Obregon, who will be performing a flamenco alegría, some flamenco dance. So stay tuned because ole, <laughs> we'll see you soon. And we're back again, it's almost six o'clock. I hope you're excited to see some flamenco, I know I am. <laughs> and just reminding you why we're here today to raise some attentions and donation money towards LLS, the wonderful organization who you just heard at 5.30, um, all the information about how they are helping people fighting blood cancer and also working to end blood cancer, finding cures and focusing on pediatrics, a, a neglected area of research and, and treatment. So yay LLS for that. And I hope that we will get some donations today to help in that effort, a very worthy effort. And so joining us now is my dear friend, Dr. Genevieve Obregon. Let's bring her into the room. Hola, hola. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How's Looks it like go? we did a quebrada with you when you came. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Anthony's going to be the videographer. He's oh, great. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Can you spend the camera? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me, sorry. Oh, there we go. No. OK. okay. <laughs> Do you want to say something first about the piece that you're performing? Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining um, Alina on this webathon. I hope that you're able to give to the LLS and their mission. Um, today I'm going to dance in Alegrias, which is a joyful dance. And today it'll be in honor of hope or cure. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start my music. Again, my name is Genevieve. All right.
Ole. Guapa. Toma que toma. Ole. Ole. Guapa. Bravo, qué bellísima. 
Thank you, Alina. Thank you for having me. Um, yes. And watch some more of the webathon. Um, everyone, please contribute to LLS. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for contributing your time. And um, I know that you've got a lot on your plate right now. And um, I know that this is also, you know, uh, special to your heart that there is this, a story there that's a connection for you. Feel free to talk about that if you want to. If you don't, that's okay as well. That's, that's perfectly fine. So unfortunately, I, I think a lot of times we don't um, pause to think too much about um, cancer treatment cures until somebody that we love or somebody who is important to us or even ourselves are affected. And so um, my dad has stage four pancreatic cancer. And for us, um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network has been really useful and um, has given us a lot of hope and um, a lot of empowerment. So if LLS is anything like the PanCan Network for individuals that have leukemia or lymphoma, we want to do um, all that we can do to support them as well. So if you have it in your heart to just give anything, you know, even a dollar, two dollars, it adds up and it can give families hope and it can give fighters something to reach toward, you know, give them other chances for treatment that maybe they feel um, a little lost or confused, or maybe they're losing hope themselves. You know, different research options and clinical trials are really um, useful for families and patients that are going through this. So if you can try to give something, um, thank you anyway, though, for being here and um, you know, just raising awareness as well, okay? My so. heart goes out to your father, you know, and, and to you and your family. So yes, thank you so much again. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, good night. Bye. Have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as uh, Genevieve mentioned, you know, until it strikes somebody close to you or yourself, we don't think about cancer. It's, uh, you have the luxury of it being something distant that you don't have to think about. But, um, it, cancer, unfortunately, is, is far too prevalent and hitting many people every day, as they saw in some of my slides, every three minutes, someone is diagnosed. And that's, that's a lot. And so uh, when people are fighting that C word, they feel alone. And so to have support through these types of organizations is very important, very important, not just for the treatment and the research that can cure and, and fund these new treatments that save lives or make lives um, live longer, possibly, then also the support to help them go, go through this. So they're not alone. So again, we appreciate everybody watching today. Please do donate. And um, if you want to contact uh, Genevieve for lessons, she teaches with Raices de Flamenco here in San Antonio, as well as the Guadalupe Cultural Center. And so she is also found performing on stage throughout the city, uh, different venues, often Carmen de la Calle. So you can also check online at Carmen's from time to time when things open up and, and hopefully see her performing there again. So thank you, Genevieve, and um, thank you, everybody. We will be back and we have our last performer coming up at seven o'clock. So it is a webathon. It's been a marathon uh, for us and we are happy to do it. So, you know, like the old days of telephone, telethons on TV, I had the idea to come up with this webathon on virtual live on the web so that we could um, catch you know, a wide audience throughout the day, as many people as possible to bring eyes and donation dollars to this important cause. So we'll see you at seven o'clock with Saramad Haddad. He is a wonderful musician, guitarist, uh, and has performed worldwide at very important venues because his skill is an art so great. Okay, guys, we are back for our final performer and I'm going to bring in Saramad. Keep it. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello. How are you? There we go. Very well. Very well. Especially now. This is the moment yeah. I've been waiting for. Some beautiful, relaxing music to bring that's, some joy and happiness to all of us. That's so great. I was I was practicing before before I went to this live. Nice. Is, is that okay to put my camera like that? Yes. Yes. It's now a wider screen. We can see more of you. Am I live right now? You are. 
And wow. I'm going to, yes, I'm going to keep my sound on, but I'm going to take my video off so you become even bigger <laughs> and you take the whole screen. All right. So we're ready whenever you are. If there's anything you'd like to say about yourself before we get started or about the, the music that you perform. All right, I'm, I'm super ready and excited. And thank you so much for inviting me for this beautiful selection live video. And thank you so much for everybody to join us this live, uh, live video. And I would just say, would say just a really fast breathe of myself. I'm Salman, I'm a musician, uh, especially on the guitar. And I teach music. And uh, I'm so glad I got this invitation from my friend, Elena. Thank you so much. And I would love to play like three pieces of music or core, it depends on the time. The first one I'm gonna play Faruka. It's a kind of, uh, it's, it's a style, one style of the, the flamenco. Yes, ole. Ole. Yes. <laughs> I think you saw that interview of myself on, the, uh, on YouTube, right? I did. And I want you to share that link with me again when you're done tonight so that I can post it because it's beautiful. It's very beautiful. I'm, even it's not that good quality, but I will send it to you. Exactly. Thank you. Yes, people need to see that. <laughs> Ole. So much. Thank you. This is a Faruka. And it's been a long time to practice on Faruka, by the way. I'm glad you, you remind me to play it. Yeah. And the next piece is going to be Turkish Mars, but in a different way. Okay. 
and a, and a, a Spanish guitar style. Interesting. Was the sound good? Okay, or, or very Yes. High? No, it, it's good. Wow, I love that. That was so cool. <laughs> I've never heard it that way before. It's a different style, right? It's Very like different. Spicy style. <laughs> yeah, peppery. <laughs> and um, amazing finger work. I mean, that takes a lot of good dexterity. Thank you so much. It, it has a lot of techniques, mm -hmm. but it's, it's fun at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to play uh, the last one I'm gonna play uh, Zarpe de la Monge. Okay. It's a Hungarian piece. 
ah. by by the gypsy gypsy Hungarian style. Okay. This piece composed to uh, the I think the piano, and then they arrange it to the guitar. Same melody, but but different key. Okay. Two, two versions of this piece. Yes.
Wow, I would love that piece. You know, the beginning, I know I've heard, I think I've heard Django Reinhardt, that famous French gypsy play it. Yeah, yeah. very, very famous piece. Yes. Well, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I just remembered right now. It's composed for the violin. Yes. And then they compose it for the, the arrangement for the arrange it for the guitar, exactly. Right. And then the last part, um, someone in the comments mentioned it almost sounds Greek. And I, I can hear that too, that exactly. style that, that isn't typical in Greek. You're Amazing. right, it's, it's a Greek style. Same yeah. like... Uh, uh, the, uh, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will promise you to play it next time on the live video. Okay. Yeah, I, I love that style, how you just kind of dangle on the precipice of a note and then, you know, run with it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a selection between different styles. Yes. Like the yes. classical touch with the, with the flamenco techniques and with some, some like several blues scales in it sometimes. Right, right. Yeah, your breadth uh, repertoire is extensive, is wide. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I was, I was thinking and hoping to, uh, because the, today, today is uh, Saturday, so I should, I should be playing at Toro right now at the same time. Right. So I was hoping to, uh, to play at Toro and open the live with the, uh, and open the, the, this meeting live with the Toro. Yes. And it will be more beautiful. But hopefully next time everything is going to be all right and we're going to pass, pass these days together. Yes. Hopefully, and we'll, we'll do our best to let people enjoy and get together and be safe. Yes. And so have they set a date when they might start opening a little bit? Because some restaurants are letting 25% by reservations. Uh, exactly. Does Tortoise have I, plans? I hear that. And I, I saw like my friends before a week, more than a week. Like they op they open some restaurant with a distance, of course. Yes. But but that's a good beginning to to to, to take a breath again and to pass to pass that horrible times. Yes. One commenter, Anna Alicia, just said that she's been lucky to hear you at Toros. Oh, <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yes. So you have a fan in our audience right now who knows you, and of course that includes Angelo and I as well. And we've tried to check you out when able. Um, at both, well, we haven't made it out to the Stone Oak still, but uh, we always love the Commerce location, and you're at both from depending which weekend. Exactly, yeah, exactly. They they are doing like a remodeling for the Toro Stone Oak and and, and downtown, uh -huh. and they said just keep 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 in touch uh, when we hear like the, the restaurant uh, able to to open again to reopen again, we're gonna give you a call very soon because. Life without music, it's just not a life. Exactly. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I mean, just these little snippets with all of you wonderful artists today. Just, I'm smiling here on the other side of the camera. <laughs> I mean, it just brings you joy, right? That connection to your, your deep soul and heart and just brings all that together. Exactly. Exactly. And how are you managing during this time? Are you offering online classes? Are you performing online Facebook Live from time to time? Facebook Live from time to time and uh, private, yes, and I teach like a private, private uh, guitar lesson okay. and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes online if they, if they prefer that. Right. And so if people wanted to contact you for events or private lessons, uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? The best way is going to be the same of my, my name, Sarmad Haddad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube at the same correct name. Okay. Sarmat Haddad. And I've been sharing, and I'm going to share your video again of the Faruka from YouTube. We've just Thank written you. each other too much. It's embedded way back. So send it to me again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will send you Faruka and Asturias if you, yes. if you would like. That would be wonderful. That'll be wonderful. Exactly. And then let me know because I will share, share, share when you're going to do a Facebook Live. Mm -hmm and post your Venmo account within your post so that people can tip you. You need to be tipped. You deserve it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We all need that at this time. 
<laughs> don't be shy. You're amazing. <laughs> You're a thank treasure you so in San Antonio. Thank you, Erwin. I really appreciate that. And thank yeah. you so much to include, to include me in this beautiful video. And I just want to say something like we, uh, we, we all going to pass these days and, uh, and we, we feel each other, we support each other, we, we enjoy each other by music, by food, by everything, by smile. And just for the people, just stay, uh, stay healthy and thankfully, and everything going to be like, like everything going to be. We'll gonna get be through okay. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> Very good sentiment. So, shukran, masalama. Atakalam shuaye, shuaye arabi. It's mean a lot of it's mean a poquito, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank I'm you. So sorry for this video. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a well. day for you and for you all. Wonderful. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Oh, that was beautiful. I don't know if you enjoyed that as much as I did, but my goodness, um, I could listen to that music for the rest of the evening, crack open my bottle of champagne that's cooling in the fridge because we have worked so hard to bring this event to you today. I hope everybody really enjoyed it. And um, I've, I've been saying all day why, you know, we are here to raise money for Leukemia Lymphoma Society to help people get treatment, to support them and their families during their fight with cancer and to fund research so that we can end cancer and make it maybe one day blood cancer a never event. And so um, again, I wanna share my personal why. Um, somebody here in, in, on Facebook, Angie Lozano, she's bid on some of the auction items. She nominated me after I participated in Light the Night, which is another campaign for Leukemia Lymph Lymphoma Society. And she reached out to me and said, I'm nominating you for the Man and Woman of Year campaign because you look like someone who cares. Well, Angie, you were right. <laughs> of course I care. And, um, you know, as a, not just as a physical therapist and having worked closely with people, helping people in their final battle in an intensive care unit, Mount Sinai Hospital, an oncology unit in Victoria Hospital in London, Ontario, Canada. Um, and then sadly, when our friend Timothy Griesenbeck was diagnosed, um, they just brought it even closer to home. So I, I've seen too many people die and uh, from leukemia or lymphoma. And so, you know, when someone asks you to help, you step up and you do what you can. And so I took the challenge very seriously. And I asked Ty if he would let me run in honor of him. And he told me, even though he um, had been fighting blood cancer, had been through chemo, and weary from it, um, he told me, I'll do you one better. I will be on your team. So even after surviving rounds of chemo and getting the lymphoblast down, he still was passionate about helping others with uh, blood cancer and wanted to help me. So uh, he hosted our first team meeting and um, shared his story openly with our team and wanting to bring that awareness of what it's like and why this is important. And so um, unfortunately, just when Ty was getting ready to have a bone marrow transplant, his best option for um, beating this forever because with AML, it can come back at any time. Uh, his lymphoblasts were up again and not at a level that would allow bone marrow transplant. So he went into the hospital to go under intense chemo to get those numbers down so he could get that bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, he did not survive that treatment. And so March 19th of this year, Ty passed away. And I'm sorry, it still makes me really emotional to talk about it. But he's my why and why I want you know, to still do this despite COVID-19. I know some candidates dropped out because it's a difficult year to be taking this on. People are struggling financially and you know, to ask people to give is, is hard to ask that of them when we know people are struggling, but cancer doesn't stop. People are still needing to survive this and fight it. And um, if I can, I'm not trying to win a competition of who can win the best because I don't expect to do that. But I do really, really want to raise 50,000 so that I can name a grant after my dear friend, honor his legacy and work with LLS so that he will be forever remembered as he deserves to be. I know he'll always be remembered in our hearts, but I would love for him to have that honor of his name on a research grant. 